Good evening. My name is Lieutenant Mike McGee. I'm the officer or the pastor at the Salvation Army Church in Burlington, North Carolina. And uh, we're in the midst of our How We Got Our Bible series. And so we've talked about the idea of inspiration. We've talked about why God chose to transmit his word through men. We've gone through and talked about every book of the Bible. But tonight we want to start talking about the process we call canonization. That is how we chose the books that are in our Bible. And what we're going to eventually see is that I wouldn't really say, I don't think we'd say that we chose the book, but rather that we recognized what books would be in our Bible. And uh, we're going to talk through that process uh, tonight. And I think this is a topic which might bring up some questions for some folks. It's a broad topic and we don't really have time in this format to talk about every nook and cranny of it. Uh, but if you have a particular question that you want to share, please feel free to share it below. Um, but we're going to start, as we try and understand how we got our Bible, we're going to start by trying to understand one of those big church words. And the big church word we want to understand today is orthodoxy. And orthodoxy, we kind of have to separate it. Like there's a denomination that we call the Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, you'll, you'll hear those phrases. And uh, we're not really talking about a particular denomination when we use the word uh, orthodoxy or when we use the word orthodox. Uh, but, but I want to understand orthodoxy because a lot of what leads to the process of canonization starts from a place of the church saying, well, let's just determine together what is orthodox. What is orthodoxy? And so orthodox means right teaching or right belief or possibly right thinking. Um, and that's what orthodoxy means in kind of a literal way. Uh, and so the church is trying to determine, well, what are the right teachings? What is the right thing to believe? Uh, a lot of times uh, orthodoxy goes along with orthopraxy that we say, what are the right things to believe? is orthodoxy. What are the right things to do is orthopraxy. But we're not talking about orthopraxy tonight. We're talking about orthodoxy, the right teachings, the right beliefs, the right, uh, the right things to, to think. Uh, so that's what we're talking about. And how do we determine, as we pull together uh, kind of a list of potential teachings of the church, how do we determine which of those teachings are orthodox? How do we determine which of those teachings are true? Which ones are right teachings? Which ones are right beliefs? Which ones can we trust? How do we make that determination? And the answer to that is we determine what is orthodox. We determine what is right or true teaching. We determine that by using a canon. And so now we have to talk and define another big church word, uh, which is canon. What is a canon? And this is canon with uh, one N in the middle instead of two. This is not a big gun that we fire. Uh, a canon is, uh, it literally means a rule or a list or a measure. And where it originally comes from is the idea of like a measuring stick, that a canon is a measuring stick against which you measure something. And so what we end up taking it to mean is that as we're trying to understand what orthodoxy is, as we're trying to understand the right teachings for the church, the canon is the measuring stick against which we measure any potential teaching. So we show up with a particular teaching and we say, is this orthodox? Is this the right thing to believe? And well, how do we know? How do we determine that? We put it up against the canon. We put it up against a canon and see how it measures up. And so canon means measuring stick, ruler, measure, uh, or eventually it's going to come to mean list. And that really, that meaning comes out of the way that we use it, which is our canon is a list of those things that we want to measure up against. And so the Bible is the canon the rule or measure that we use to determine right teaching or orthodoxy. 
So that's, that's simple enough. We want to know what right teachings are. We want to know, therefore, what our canon should we, we've said our canon is the Bible. Um, and so we're going to use that to measure our teachings and, and see if they measure up. I think all of that makes sense to me. But the next question that we would want to ask is, well, how do we determine what is canonical? Or how do we determine what should be included in the canon? Uh, now, you'll have to excuse me. This, this whole front section, we've used a lot of big words, and we've talked uh, a lot to, to try and understand the big church word concepts that we need to understand in order to have the rest of this conversation. But at the heart of it, we have the church trying to understand what the right things to believe are and saying we need a canon. We need a rule or measuring stick against which to put our beliefs and so that canon ends up being the Bible. And what we want to talk about tonight is how we chose which books would be included in the Bible, which books are canonical, which books are measuring sticks for our faith. So I want to do an exercise with you, but let's pretend that you were raised in the early church. And not the earliest church, but, but pretty early. And in that time period, which we'd still consider the early church, John Wesley would consider it the early church. In the late 200s, you're raised. And as you're brought up, your parents lead you to believe in Christ. And uh, you go and meet in somebody's house for church every week. And as persecution rises up around you under Emperor Diocletian, uh, you kind of are are forced more and more to hide and move your meetings and you kind of have to uh you have to protect your faith in some ways to make sure that you don't become victims of the latest round of persecution and that's the church you're brought up in and in your local church that you're brought up in they're trying to determine we're talking about the late 200s here so it's been a little while now since jesus ascension and uh and we don't probably have any of our kind of original apostles left and so your church leadership, maybe your very own parents, are trying to determine, well, what are the right things to teach our people? How do we determine what the right teachings are? We learned a word for that. How do we determine what is orthodox? And so that early church would have looked to certain documents they had available. They would have looked to certain letters that maybe they had gotten a copy of from a neighboring church. They would have looked to certain books uh, as they looked at like what we now consider the Old Testament, they would have looked at the Hebrew scriptures. They would have looked at these things to bring them in together to help shape what they believe as they say, hey, we need a way to determine what is orthodox for our church. What is the right thing to believe for us? And so they would have used some of these different letters and books and things. And then an amazing thing happens. So you grow up in this church and eventually you become a leader in your local community. And an amazing thing happens in the early 300s, the emperor Constantine converts to Christianity. And so for all of Christianity's existence up until this point, the church has lived under massive persecution. The church has had to live, if you were a Christian, in fear that someone's coming to get you any day just because you believe in Jesus. But all of a sudden, the emperor believes. And it looks as though Christianity might be the new state religion of Rome. And so now all of a sudden, you've gone from, you're an outsider, you're, you know, you're persecuted. The, the main function you're trying to work out every week is where we can meet safely. Uh, and now all of a sudden, they say, Hey, we want to bring the whole church together. In AD 325, the Council of Nicaea is held. And in, in 325, uh, there was a controversy going on in the world at the time um, that some Christians were trying to work out. And so Constantine said, well, hey, let's bring everyone together, all the Christians in the world. We want to have, and this is what uh, nowadays... Uh, a lot of the church looks at as the first ecumenical council. Um, and so that, that we're going to bring everybody together from all around the world to meet and talk about 
uh, these particular controversies. In particular, they're talking about the Arian controversy at the Council of Nicaea. But this meeting in 325 is the first time uh, really in the history of Christianity that Christian leaders from all around the world are allowed to travel and meet together. And so you leave your little church and you come to the Council of Nicaea. Now, some people don't go. Some people think this is still a trick. They're still trying to persecute us. They just want to round up all the Christian leaders in the world in one place. But you decide to go. I'm going to go participate in this council and see what's going on. And as you show up there, you find other believers from all around the world that have been looking at and reading and using the same measuring sticks that your congregation has been using. And so you, you find that you're able to talk to people you've never met from vastly different places and contexts, and you're able to say, yeah, well, we, we read Paul's letters in our church. Oh, yeah, we have a copy of the Gospel of Mark. And maybe someone shows up with a book you've not heard of, and you go, no, no, we've not seen that one. But for the most part, you find hey, those books that you held sacred in your church, that you used in your church to help determine orthodoxy, the right belief for your church, the right teachings, that there are churches all over the world using those same books. I want to pretend some more, uh, and, and we're going to go to a new scenario now, but I want you to imagine that uh, it's, it, it would have to be before the internet, or we'd have to imagine that there's no internet. But we say, hey, we want to get together a group. We're going to bring together a group of the world's finest historians. And so whoever the best historian in your community is, we'd like you to send them to our, uh, to our little meeting place. And we want them to agree about a list of the presidents. And we'll say for the sake of this exercise that they're not allowed to look at history books. They're not allowed. Now, they, they would be. They'd have these things memorized. But, but we'll say they're, they're not allowed to look at the Internet. They're not allowed to just look up. Let me just pull up a list of presidents from some history textbook. And there you go. We got them all. But we'd say we want to bring you together and we want to put you in a room and say we'd like you to generate a list of all the presidents of the United States in order. Well, I have a couple of thoughts about that exercise. I think if we put that group of people in a room, world-class history experts, that we went to every community and said, hey, who's the person you have that knows the best about history? Send them to meet with us. That It would actually be a pretty simple task for them to say, here's our list of the uh, presidents of the United States. And so what I want to acknowledge about what they would be doing is this group would not be choosing the presidents of the United States. They, they would not be ga gathering together and going, well, I liked this guy or I didn't like that guy, so we should or shouldn't include them in the list based on how I feel about them. Right? They're not choosing who the presidents of the United States are. They're not deciding. They're not able to go, oh, well, you know, I really, I liked Abraham Lincoln a lot. I feel like he should be first instead of George Washington, so let's move him to the front of the line. Like, they're not deciding what order these guys go in. They're not uh, choosing which ones they like and which ones they don't like. Those aren't the words we'd use to describe what our group of historians are using. We describe it like this. They are recognizing who the presidents of the United States are. They are listing who the presidents of the United States are. They are agreeing about who the presidents of the United States are. Those are the kinds of words we would use. And so when we talk about the early church gathering it, its canon together, a lot of times we have this image, and I think it comes to us from like different conspiracy history channel documentaries. But we have this image that, oh, the church is getting their canon together and they're just picking these different books and excluding books they don't like and they're, they're choosing what they like and it's all this big political thing. But in my opinion, that's just not true that what the early church is doing as they're gathering together the first time, and it's important to me, 325 is the first time ever they're allowed to meet. We're going to talk later about when they settle in on a particular canon. But 
first time ever they were allowed to meet. And then later that century, they'd set down a canon together. That as the early church is pulling this canon together, they are not deciding what will be in the Bible. They are not choosing what will be in the Bible. They are recognizing what God has already revealed to them as holy scriptures. They are listing those books, which they have found in their church to be exceedingly helpful in uh, determining orthodoxy and determining the right things to believe. Like these are the ways we would describe what they're doing. They're not coming together to decide or to choose. They're coming together to remember, to recognize, to list, and to acknowledge those books which God has already revealed to the church over the first 300 years of its existence, that these are books I've given you for your benefit. And so we want to start by looking at the Old Testament canon. I think the Old Testament canon for me is easier to talk about as a Protestant, uh, because for the Old Testament canon, the Protestant church, for the most part, says, well, what is the Jewish canon? What do Jewish people look to and say, these are our most sacred texts, and those are the books we want to include? I think in particular, we're interested in this idea of well, what were the texts that were canonical for Jews at the time that Jesus was walking around? What were those books Jesus would have studied and read and learned about as he came along? It's important to note the Protestant and the Hebrew canon are the same. There are some differences in the order of things. There are some differences in the way some things are grouped together or split apart in the way those, those are put together. And there are some reasons for that. But for example, uh, the Hebrew Bible has the book of Kings as one work. Uh, the Protestant Bible splits it into two works uh, so that it's easier to read and understand. Um, so we have some friends in the Christian faith who have some additional books that they like to include in the Old Testament canon, uh, or rather we might call it apocrypha, that they have some apocryphal books that they'd like to include. These are books that occur between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so there are 14 extra intertestamental books in the Catholic Bible, and then the uh, Orthodox Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, comes along and adds three more on top of that. And different Protestant traditions feel different ways about those books. Um, I would say, from my perspective, I'm glad they have those books. I don't personally consider them part of the canon of Scripture, because I, I think what we look to as uh, Protestant believers, as we say, well, what were the books that Jesus had available? And, and that's what we want to consider. Um, and so the, the Catholics and the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, they add on another 14 and then 17 books to the list of books in the Bible. And uh, for the most part, those books cover um, the, the time period between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. And so there is some historical value there, but it's also worth noting uh, that one of the things that the Protestant Reformation aimed to point out is that there are certain teachings that the Catholic Church derives later on directly from the Apocrypha that we don't find supported in the rest of Scripture. And so we tend to look at that as the Protestant Church by and large um, and say, I don't know that we accept those as on the same level as the rest of Scripture. 